Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco SY. Today we're continuing our Women in Engineering series, and we're very excited to have with us Megan Sanford, and she is the Vice President, Chief Product Security Officer, Energy Management at Snyder Electric. So welcome, Megan. Hi, thanks so much, Chris. Happy to be here today. Oh, we're very excited. This has been a fun series, and so much value has, has come out for our listeners. I've learned a ton. Very excited to, to walk this with you, and we, we kind of like to get these episodes started, Megan, just by letting you talk a little bit about your journey to where you're at now. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I guess starting out, a lot of people ask me, like, how in the world did you get into security? Uh, my background is that I come from a, a place in this world uh, known as Charlotte County in Virginia. Uh, it's one of the larger counties, but it's also one of the most rural counties in Virginia. I think we have one flashing stoplight now, uh, but essentially no no real stoplights in the county. It's 500 square miles of just back roads, farming. Um, it's really an awesome place to grow up. My family had been there for generations and my mom was a single mom. My parents had uh, had split when I was really young. Uh, I still saw my dad and stuff like that, but he lived in Raleigh. And so it was kind of the uh, single mom, you know, hey, it's me and you, kid. We're going to take on the world. And she worked a lot. And I stayed with my great grandparents who at the time were in their 80s. But these were people that were born in like the 1910, 1914 time period. So I think that the way that I grew up was, you know, kind of a unique experience for for someone growing up in the 80s and 90s and that um, the folks that raised me were really from uh, a much different generation. I guess the what we would refer to as the the great generation, you know, they they lived through World War One and World War Two and the Depression and all that stuff. So not a not a lot of TV, uh, a lot of hanging out outside, a lot of uh shucking peas with grandma in the front yard type deal. And uh, I actually, and sometimes this is a difficult thing for me to share. So this is only actually the second time that I've really been honest and told people, you know, why, why do you think you went into security is that uh, my mom had gotten remarried and she, she married a guy. He was nice most of the time, no problems there. But um, he had a drinking problem, and sometimes when he would drink, he um, he was not a nice guy. And, I mean, it was definitely a physically abusive relationship. And I remember as a child, um, I had, you know, punch marks, holes in my door and the walls that I would cover up with posters and things like that so people wouldn't see when they came over to the house. And she eventually did get out of that relationship, so there is a happy ending, folks. But um, I remember watching, I was probably seven or eight at the time, the movie The Bodyguard came out with Whitney Houston and Kevin Costner. And I remember watching that movie with my mom. And I think most little girls, you know, would be like, man, I want to be a singer. I want to be like Whitney Houston. But at the time, I just remember, like, that movie making this, like, crazy impact on me and that I was like, I need to be like Kevin Costner. I need to like basically be this strong person that is a bodyguard that can protect my mom. And so from that point on, I was really interested in the military. I was really interested in war. I was really interested in figuring out why do people have conflict? Why, why do countries go to war? Why do people suffer? How, how can we protect one another? How can we, you know, do all of these things? How do you protect things? And so I remember reading The Art of War by the time I was in high school. I wanted to go to the Naval Academy. I ultimately ended up uh, going to VCU. I had made it into William & Mary. I got waitlisted at UVA, but I made it into VCU and I applied there because they had a degree, the first degree program actually in the country, for Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. And I went there and I got my degree in Homeland Security, Emergency Preparedness, as well as political science, because remember, I like the whole theory of conflict theory and 
peace and the United Nations and, you know, how, how does this all fit together, right? And so once I had my degree, and actually a little bit before then, I had started interning in the governor's office of Commonwealth Preparedness. And I got that internship because there was a Henrico police officer that was sitting in front of me in class one day, and he turned around and said, hey, uh, Megan, I, I've been doing this internship in the governor's office, and it's going to be tying up in a few weeks. Uh, they're going to be looking for somebody else. If you're interested, I'm happy to pass on your name. And so that's really how I got my foot in the door was, you know, this nice guy basically turning around saying like, hey, like, I think that, you know, you do a good job in class and you get along with people. You're a nice person. And so I'm happy to give you a recommendation. And that's how I got started. Very cool. So from there, after that internship, where, what other roles have you taken in your in your career? So following the internship, I really wanted to get hired in the governor's office, right? And they were they were trying to find funding. I mean, it's the government, uh, kind of popular to, I guess, kind of counter to popular belief. The governor's office is not a place where people make, you know, tons of money or anything like that. In fact, uh, people probably make less money in the governor's office than they do in other state agencies. But they were trying to find funding to hire me on part time to begin with and then full time. And I ended up uh, getting a part-time role, and then I started out in interoperable communications, which was kind of the doing away of the 10 codes that police officers use and moving more towards common language. It was P25 compliance, narrow banding. At the same time, I was doing uh, more work with the Homeland Security Working Committees and learning critical infrastructure protection. So that was under Tim Kaine. That was an awesome experience. And then when the new administration came in with Bob McDonnell, I was one of maybe a handful of people that stayed on during that transition. And I stayed on because I was a Homeland Security person. I was not very high up in the office at that time or anything like that. And I guess they didn't see a harm in giving me a shot. And that's what they did. And, you know, I'll be forever thankful for that opportunity. And they ended up, uh, Governor McDonnell ended up promoting me actually to running all of critical infrastructure protection. So I was in my mid-20s uh, getting tons of training. I was spending tons of time kind of running up and down 95 to the national capital region, to D.C., to be in meetings, as well as running um, running up and down 64 to the east to Norfolk and the Naval Base and, you know, all the important assets you can imagine that Virginia, as well as the country, has uh, in that area. And so tons of experience. I got tons of training. I was even trained in nuclear first response. I was trained in um, bomb making awareness programs. So really lots of things that I guess you would consider traditional security with gun gu guns, guards and gates, lots of policy work. I contributed to the first national infrastructure protection plan. I got put on that review committee. So I guess the best way to shore it up was that I volunteered for everything that I could possibly volunteer for, and I was in grad school at the time, and those were very, very busy times in my life, but it was all worth it. But it was kind of like, you know, burning the candle at both ends, if that makes sense. No doubt. I mean, all I'm hearing, Megan, is, is you got the hustle. You got to drive. But, I mean, <laughs> it, it was put in front of you, but, but, I mean, you had to put in the work. So, hats off. That is amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, I mean, and I really appreciate it. I don't, I don't want to gloss over this. Thank you for being so open with this in the beginning of your story. Um, you know, sometimes those those stories can be difficult to to go through, but I think they're, uh, they're, they're very inspirational for our listeners and uh, just to hear what you, you've overcome. And it does sound like your, your great-grandparents put a, a lot of good uh, values in you. And, um, uh, you know, we talked before we started recording, you're from Charlotte County. I'm from Mecklenburg County. They're, uh, sister counties, if you will, very in, in much uh, rural areas, but, uh, our high schools even competed against each other. So Meg and I have, have a little more in common than, than most people may think other than she is a rock star in, in her field. And I'm just, I'm so honored to, to talk to you today, Megan. Oh, uh, Chris, that's, uh, that's really nice of you. And, you know, what's interesting is that um, kind of privately with other security professionals, you know, your background will come up and things like that once you get to know people well enough. And what's funny and what I had someone in government tell me one time 
it is kind of known within security that children that come from, you know, challenging home situations, especially where there can be abuse involved. One thing that gets ingrained in these children that makes them really, really good at security is that they're constantly scanning their environment. If you look at someone that works in security, uh, that especially has had like a physical security background, they are constantly looking at everything around the room. They are constantly moving their heads. They are constantly, their eyes are moving. They're constantly scanning because they're looking for anything that could pop up at any minute. And that often comes from childhood experiences where maybe there was an abusive person in the home and you never kind of knew when the shoe was going to drop, if that makes sense. So you always had to be on heightened alert in case something happened. You know, a long time ago, I, I asked my mom one time, I was like, why was it that we always like wore shoes in the house? Lots of families, especially when I moved to the city, like, the parents would ask you to like take your shoes off when you went inside the house. And that just wasn't something that I was ever used to doing. And she said, where we come from, you always keep your shoes on because we grew up in a farming community and you never know when you might have to run outside. You never know if like a barn will catch on fire or something will happen with one of the animals. So basically, and it's just, again, you go back to different, you know, where you grow up and what your experiences are. And to this day, I wear shoes inside my house because you never know when you might have to run outside, right? You never know when you might have to go. And so, again, uh, long story short, um, it's really interesting the things that we learn and uh, people that are willing to share. Uh, it does take a certain amount of courage, you know, but I think uh, I think it's worth it. No doubt. I mean, and thank you. I mean, but you're right. I guess those values of, of constantly scanning, being aware being ready, ready to act at, at a drop of a hat. So, I mean, maybe these are just some of the core traits that, you know, really line up well for the, the types of uh, your your career path in general. So, you know, Megan, we're trying with this series to really speak to the women out there, to encourage them to, to, to look outside and, and to consider this uh, our industry in general or manufacturing or whatever it may be. So for the women that are listening, is there any advice you would like to share them share with them? Sure. Um, and I guess I'll continue the, the story a little bit in that after I left the governor's office, and this dovetails nicely into the question that you asked, Chris, is, um, you know, what advice do you offer? So when I had been working in government, um, my career kind of progressed into writing a lot of response plans with critical infrastructure and asset owners and plants and power plants and, and all of that. And I, I networked and I met people and I tried to be pleasant and nice and friendly and personable. And those connections eventually led me to uh, to General Electric, where a gentleman, my first boss at GE, he recruited me in. His name was Corey Jackson, uh, really super nice guy. He, um, you know, he kind of took a leap of faith with me, if you will. And he was recruiting for someone to lead GE's product security incident response team. And I was like, Corey, I was like, I don't have enough cyber experience to to do this, man. Like, I'm not qualified for the job. I said, all I do is like policy, homeland security, response planning things. And he was like, Megan, he was like, you're a nice person. You know how to work with people. You're honest. Uh, you do what you say you're going to do. And you always volunteer to do more because, you know, you care about something and you think it's the right thing. He said, we can teach you cyber. And so I said, all right, Corey, I'll do it. And so I went over to GE and, you know, kind of carried that same philosophy where after a few years of doing uh, PCERT work, I was promoted to lead uh, product security for GE Global Research. And I took that on. And it was kind of one of these things where at the time, maybe I didn't feel like I was 100 percent qualified for the job, but maybe I was 70 percent qualified for the job. And so I went for it. Right. But the thing that I, I made people know was that. I wanted them to be successful and I was willing to work to make the organization successful. And I was going to be honest and say, if I didn't know something, I wasn't going to kind of, you know, pander my way through a conversation or waste someone's time as well as if I did something wrong or if I didn't approach a situation correctly, I was going to say, Hey, like I, I really messed up. Like I need to make this right. What can I do? And so I learned early on to 
admit my mistakes early. You know, my, my mom used to tell me growing up, you know, a 99% truth is a 100% lie. And so I always try to be as transparent about things when I can, whenever today I'm talking with customers, uh, I will, I will give them that transparency because that's their time that they're spending with me. You know, that's money. And so I, I try to approach situations uh, like that. So I guess that's some initial advice I would give. Well, I think it's great advice. I mean, just, just honesty, ownership of, of just owning mistakes when they happen, that transparency. I love your quote on the 99% of truth is a 100% lie. I mean, great advice. You know, there, there are also obstacles out there, Megan, for women when they're coming into it, this industry or any of them. What could they expect? So I'll, I'll tell a story again from my past. I'm kind of a storyteller. The first boss that I had in the governor's office, awesome guy. I'm still uh, very good friends with him today. He said, listen, Megan, he said, I, I hate to tell you this, but it is what it is. Um, you can't joke around and, you know, kind of be silly like some of the guys here in the office do. You know, you're you're going to have to be very professional. You have to be on your A game all the time, every second of the day. And like, I, I went into that and what he told me was right at the time, you know, that I didn't necessarily maybe have the look of someone being in Homeland Security. I was walking around uh, critical infrastructure sites with people that were former special forces doing these site assessments. Uh, I mean, I, I probably looked a bit out of place, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, once people got to know me, they knew that I was trying to learn. I was serious about learning. I wasn't there to joke around or be silly or anything like that. But that stuck with me a lot through my early career where people would tell me, um, when I got into the corporate world, they were like, you know, man, like you're pretty rigid. Like you're serious all the time. Like you don't joke around. And I guess to some people, they were like, she probably needs to lighten up a little bit. And in, in hindsight, they were right. So if I can give you the advice is that don't be like me in my early career. Um, joke around, uh, be nice to people, be personable. Don't think that you have anything to prove out there. Uh, when you're writing an email, uh, don't write it, you know, like you're, you know, like an academic professor and you have to you know, use all these big words and, you know, um, kind of in inflate the conversation or be too rigid or harsh or anything like that. Just type it out like you would actually say it in a conversation. And that's going to resonate with people a lot more. And that's going to help you establish that connection to where they trust you. Because let's face it, everything in life moves at the speed of trust. It moves at the speed of one person having faith and courage to trust another. And that's how relationships form and that's how work gets done. So again, don't, don't take yourself too seriously, be yourself and communicate in just a very, you know, plain speak type of way. Very good. I love what, love what you said there. Just everything moves at the speed of trust, right? So I mean, be comfortable with who you are, trust in yourself. Don't, don't try to be false. I mean, that, that people can, they pick up on that, don't they, Megan, when, when you're trying to be something you're not? Oh, oh yeah, definitely. And I, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell another little story from the governor's office and say that I was in a meeting one time and uh, my, my, one of my old bosses, I won't say his name, he was in the military. And in fact, he had gone to Iraq and he had helped write the Iraqi constitution uh, during the Iraq war. I mean, just to tremendous person, tremendous human being. Um, we were in a meeting one time and there was someone sitting across from the table from us and they like plainly would not like straightforward answer a question he was asking him. And, and finally, you know, um, he, he looked across at the guy and said, look, he said, if you tell me that you don't know the answer, it's not going to offend me. And so, I'll, I mean, it's one of these points in your career. I mean, I'll always remember that, and I'll always remember that advice. No doubt, right? Don't don't keep talking just to talk. I mean, you got to get to the point. And, and like you said, not no one's okay. But I think you said earlier, you're, you're the first to admit if you don't know something. But you're also the type of person I can tell you're going to figure it out. You, you're going to do that research and then come back and answer it. So that's a great story, Megan. Thank you for sharing that. Now, you've, you've mentioned, I think you said, uh, Corey Jackson. 
was that was he a mentor for you or are there other mentors that have helped you along the way yeah absolutely Corey was a big mentor to me and he was a big champion and he tried to bring other women into the field that maybe had started out with different backgrounds and he he kind of helped shine a light on women in cybersecurity, especially uh, in the office that we worked at. And he was the first to say, like, yeah, we're going to give this person a chance. Right. And he was also the first person uh, to say, like, we could have done something better. And so, yeah, I, I absolutely loved working with Corey. Uh, he's been a, a CISO at a few different Fortune 500 companies since then. Uh, again, just a tremendous person that I have a lot of respect for. Uh, another person is Nazrin Razai. Uh, she was kind of my big boss at GE. She was the CISO of GE. Fascinating background. She uh, she was born in Iran. Uh, her dad was a lawyer. Uh, he was blind. She lived through the Iranian Revolution, and I, I guess the way that she would tell the story is that her family was not that that religious, and so when she went to apply to go to college, she couldn't pass the the religious exam requirements. And so she was able to eventually uh, make her way out of that country and, and go to college. And she got a degree and then she worked for a few big IT companies and she worked her way up. And I mean, again, like another female, like Nazarene's story is compelling. And again, like the way that she tells it, She's not complaining or, you know, making herself out to be a victim. She's simply stating that, you know, the experiences that she has had make her the professional that that she is. And she's, again, one of my absolute favorite people. She's a straight shooter. She's a kind person. Um, she gave me several good tips in terms of, as a female, navigating conversations with men across the table. Her and I are not very big people by stature. And so she said, you know, you can use your hands to make yourself bigger or, you know, grab attention to what you're saying. So just little tricks of the trade like that. She just left a huge impact on me and I'll forever be thankful for, for Nazrin's advice and guidance. No doubt, Megan. So have you had a chance to mentor or, or you know, kind of pour into others at this point in your career? Yeah, definitely. I think that the way the universe works is that in order to get in this life, you have to give. And the moment that you stop giving is the moment that the universe is going to stop giving to you. So yes, at any given time, I mentor several females in the field and outside of the field, whether it's, you know, just being someone that they can call and I'll listen to whatever you have to tell me, or we can cry together about things and we can share our experiences. I can give you tactics and strategies or I might tell you a story of when I've been through something similar and maybe they'll feel like they can share things with me and I learn as much from them as they do from me. And so I think it's about connection and feeling like you have connection with people and that someone else cares and they're willing to listen and there there are positive and healthy ways that you can move through problems. And um, one thing that I'm very big at is I don't like complaining. You know, I had rather... I might sit on something for a second and I might feel the heat of the emotion that I'm feeling in that moment. But I, I really want to redirect that energy into something that I can take action on. Because to me, again, going back to my childhood, control is what feels good to me. Taking action on something is what feels good to me. And, you know, I'm in my 30s now and I, and I finally recognize that about myself. But that's what I want other people to have, too. No doubt. Absolutely, Megan. I mean, and just having that, that empathy and compassion for others, I mean, you're, just the way you're, you're pouring into them, you're, you're building that next generation. And, and thank you for recognizing the importance of to get, you have to give, you're right. So uh, hats off to you. And, and for this series in particular, Megan, we really want to, to help our, the women listening understand certain things about industry. And there's a lot of myths out there uh, about the way things are when you come to work in industry, anything you'd like to, to uh, debunk at this point and say, no, this is not how it really is? I will say that in my experience, I, I think that there is, there's the impression or people talk about that, you know, maybe men don't want to give women opportunities or maybe like they aren't first considered or something like that. That has not been my experience. Um, 
again, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen and I'm not trying to, to diminish um, the experiences of other people, but I think that a lot of where I have gotten in my career uh, has been due to, to kind men. Uh, just like there are kind women and there are unkind women, I'm sure that there are unkind men. But in cyber, I don't see that as much. And it may be just because we all kind of need each other to do our jobs. Like there are so few of us that we all have to go along to get along. And if there are issues, uh, we kind of lay that out. We kind of want to lay the code out on the table, as they say, to figure things out. I think that in cyber, you don't see as many of those challenges. The other things I would say is things to debunk that women have to appear more professional than men to get ahead. I don't think so. The other point is I, I know that I've, I have been told, I'd say the one time where I had maybe a not so great experience with a manager, and this was an isolated case, was that he would say things to me like, you know, you, you show too much teeth. Well, I, I know that, you know, sometimes I have a funny looking smile, but like, what do you mean? Like I show too much teeth and like I had to Google, like, what does he mean? But what the statement means, as I came to find out, was that I was too aggressive. And that was absolutely, uh, I mean, that was just a silly thing to say, because if he had been sitting across from a man, he wouldn't have told a man, you show too much teeth, you know? Um, so I'd say, if you're a female like me, if you've had somebody tell you that, like, don't listen to it, uh, is what I would say. I don't think that aggressive is the word. I think that showing passion and as long as you're being respectful to other people and, you know, being thoughtful in the words that you're choosing so that you're not putting someone on the defensive or putting them on their back foot or making them feeling like they're being diminished. I think it's absolutely fine to show passion. And that's how I would kind of reframe, you know, that point. Absolutely. And Megan, hopefully uh, you never know who listens to these podcasts. So Maybe that that gentleman will will run across this, and I'd love for him to to take a listen and and hear this. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Well, I, I mean, to be honest, I believe in in nuance to situations, and I think that as human beings, uh, maybe in today's society, we've forgotten not to see things as kind of one way versus another way. Is that you have to understand nuance, and um, I think that this guy's experience was that he. He was a quieter person. He was very family oriented and his experience and his profile were just different than mine were. And I, I think honestly, he was trying to help me in his eyes. Right. But at the end of the day, it's, it's just nuance, but yeah, there, there has been a time or two where I've been like, man, you know, I wish that I could have that conversation again, but we all move through life at our own pace with our own experiences. And I would still be his friend and tell him that, you know, I think a lot of him and, and all of that. So I, again, it goes back to, to nuance, right? Yeah. I mean, and that just speaks even more so to your character as a person. So, I mean, I guess one more question about work and then we, I'd like to talk a little bit outside of work, but when, when you're in your role, Megan, and, and you're, you're getting that fulfillment, you're in that moment of joy where, where you're doing the work that you felt like there, you know, you were put here to do your purpose is behind it. What are you doing in those moments? So I think I, I'm probably talking to people. I'm a big talker in case you couldn't tell, but I, I love to sit across from people and I love to think of new ways of doing something. And I love to see the light and the excitement in other people. Like that's what drives me is seeing other people get excited about the things that we can work on. I love being in the moment and in the energy and ideating and thinking together and then building things. I'm definitely a builder. I love to build new response plans. I love to figure out how different things that are awesome in and unto themselves can connect together to like support even more things. I, I love opening doors for people. I love connecting people. Um, really, I guess a core thing about me is that I absolutely love other people. Like I love all different types of people. I love the perspectives that they bring and I love that sharing and I love that connection. Absolutely. That's great. I mean, thank you for sharing that. I, I thought that would be your answer, but I wanted to make sure. I mean, it's, it's, you're all over it. So <laughs> yeah, thank you. 
I tell you, Megan, we, we, for these episodes, we like to, to kind of take a, a, a detour, if you will, and just get off the career path and, and let our listeners know a little bit about you outside of work. So any hobbies, anything you like to do for fun? Sure. <laughs> I wish that I could say I was a pretty interesting person outside of work, but so I love spending time with family. I love doing like genealogical research. I love talking to older members of my family about experiences that they had growing up. I love finding old pictures. I love shopping. I used to love rock collecting, actually. Uh, I know that's kind of a nerdy thing to say, but I, I love stuff like that. Lately, I've gotten into like interior design, like looking at different designs or, you know, different pictures or, or styles to kind of make home feel more like home. I'm definitely a person where my environment impacts my energy. And so I don't like clutter. Like I, I clutter stresses me out. So I've very much been like, all right, let's go through the house. All right, kids, like go through your clothes. We're going to donate all the stuff that doesn't fit anymore. Um, I have definitely within the past few years, I've been about, if I'm not utilizing something, if I'm not wearing this article of clothing, it needs to go someplace where it can get good use from somebody where somebody else will love it and appreciate it more than I am. I am really about kind of that type of energy. And gee, I'm trying to think we like boating. We like going out on Lake Gaston. I uh, love the water, love swimming, love the sunshine, uh, all of all of those things. Cool. Very cool. Now, f- for your family research, are you doing anything, any software you use to, to track that? Uh, I did like the 23andMe. Uh, somebody had given me one of those kits for Christmas, and so I tried it out, and nothing real interesting popped up from there. But before my, my grandmother, Anne, she passed away. Um, she had like done a lot of that type of research. And so she got me started. And then with the databases and the things like the little clues and hints you can get from other people, I've tracked back some pretty interesting things. Yeah, I I got into that last year myself. And same deal, just did what I think I did uh, Ancestry and uh, just went back several, probably five or six generations back to, uh, you know, on both sides, my mother and my father so it's it's kind of neat the stuff you can i like it when those little leaves and things pop up and you got little clues it's fun <laughs> yeah absolutely i uh i use ancestry uh too so i'll bring up the app from time to time if i happen to think about it on like a saturday morning sipping some coffee and then it's like shoot an hour just passed and I, i've been you know checking out this stuff but it's really cool yeah no doubt no doubt now you've, you've mentioned family is important to you anything you like to share with our listeners about your family so I'm, I'm married. My, my husband is Jeff. He, he's actually a journeyman electrician. So he, uh, he had been in college at East Carolina. And I think in kind of year two time frame, he was just like, hey, like this isn't for me. I, uh, I, I want to go do something that's hands on. And so he, he's an electrician. Uh, he's at work now. He does not sit behind a desk. Uh, I think the other day he said that he pulled over 900 feet of wire <laughs> in one day. Wow. So I think he could. He could barely walk by the time he got home, but, you know, he's kind of salt of the earth type person. My daughter, Naomi, uh, she started uh, middle school the other day. So sixth grade, she's kind of at that, that age. And I think with COVID and things hitting, it's really hard for the kids. I can't imagine what they're going through, but I frequently say at like age 11, they're a little bit socially homeless because they're not old enough to like hang out with the big kids yet. And they're older they're too old to hang out with the the younger kids. So they're really kind of stuck, I think, where they only want to be around like their age group. And that that's absolutely appropriate, right? But with COVID and things, I know that she got really lonely, but I think she's glad to be back at school. And I hope that, you know, we're gonna see a turnaround from all this stuff soon. My my son, John Logan, he just went into kindergarten and he's a live wire. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, he's the type of kid where he'll be melting your heart one minute. He got off the school bus yesterday and I said, how was your first day? And he said, mommy, I, I missed you. It's just not the same without you. And it's just like, kid, you're melting my heart. What am I going to do? And then the next minute, you know, we'll be back up at the house and, you know, he's getting into something or doing something crazy. And you're like, what are you doing, kid? 
So, you know, it's constantly pull and pull. It's always something going on in the house. But that's, you know, that's a little bit about my family. That's cool. Thanks for sharing that. I have a um, a fifth grader and she's 10. So I, I'm, I'm feeling you there, what you're going through with, with your young, with Naomi, because uh, that is a, just a different age. And I have a third grader too. So she's eight, but uh, they're still at the eight year old. They're, they're still kind of in the smaller kid stuff too. So it's, it's, it's an interesting age for sure. So you know, thanks for walking us through that, Megan. So is there anything you're curious about right now? Any books, podcasts, or anything like that you would recommend? And it's, this could be, you know, personal type stuff or business. Just curious about what, you know, what you would recommend to others. So one thing that I'm very passionate about, given where, you know, we come from, Chris, is I'm very passionate about providing high-speed internet to rural areas. I really think that over the past few decades, we've viewed, you know, kind of public education as the great equalizer. And in many ways, it, it has been. It's providing opportunity to people, and it, and it should be. And quite frankly, I think that we could probably be doing a little bit better there. But high-speed internet in rural areas is going to offer up a better way of life for, uh, for the people and, and the places from where we come from. And that today, I remember my mom, um, when I was a little girl, she would have to drive an hour and a half to Richmond to go to work. That's a lot. But I mean, that's what she had to do to make any type of good living wage to support us. I would like for people in rural areas across the country to be able to have remote jobs, working in cybersecurity, working in IT, working any type of office job, engineering. I mean, you name it. There are so many things that we could do through the computer, through our homes now. And if they had the equal opportunity that people that live in and around cities have, they would have a better quality of life. You would see a restoration of these communities. You would see an improvement in the public school system because there would be a bigger tax base to build better schools, pay p- teachers better, all of that, all of this ripple effect you would see in, in improving the world. And so I'm uh, closely monitoring uh, Starlink, which is Elon Musk's uh, program to bring high-speed internet to all uh, of the world, basically, right? Not just the United States, although he's starting here in the United States, thankfully. And I'm just such a big proponent of initiatives like that. You know, I think it's a moonshot, right? I I support these big uh, ideas that seem like it's going to take a lot to do, but That's what America is all about, right? We're about taking the leap and saying we can build these things. We can figure this out. And I think it's high time that we did it. No doubt. I mean, I'm with you. I mean, we grew up in the same area and it's it's tough, you know, when you don't have that that access or or the ability to to get the data the way that uh, you do when you're in Richmond, for instance. So uh, thank you for sharing that, Megan. And we love to wrap these episodes up on Eco Ask Why with the why, where we get down to the purpose and to summarize that for our listeners, you know, why do you enjoy the path you're on? What, what is your drive? My drive is about the connections. You know, it's about the connection to, to people and ideas and bridging those connections and getting the right people in touch with one another so that the really cool ideas that are going to make our lives better and make our children's lives better, our grandchildren's lives better, so that they have a chance to be connected in the right way and have a good start and then passionate people that um, care about doing the right thing and are dedicated and can execute on things and get the job done. That That's what I'm passionate about. Well, it definitely came through in this conversation. And Megan, you are definitely one of our heroes. Appreciate your time and, and the truth that you brought for our listeners. Thank you, Chris. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share. So thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.